Reminds me of what happened 20 years ago tomorrow when our next guest and I likewise raised our right hands to take the oath of office. The oath of office chokes me up to this day. Uh, but I'm very pleased uh, to see the smiling gentleman from the land of Lincoln, the great state of Illinois, former United States Congressman Michael Patrick Flanagan, who is the president now of Flanagan Consulting. Michael, we're in need of your consultation this morning. Will the new Republican majority be able to repeal Obamacare? Yes, I think they can. Good morning, J.D., and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to um, you, pal. And looking back 20 years ago tomorrow, mercy. Hard to believe, huh? <laughs> well, I think the, uh, I think the uh, current House leadership, Senate leadership is committed to repealing and replacing Obamacare. Uh, I think the biggest sticking point is the individual mandate and the employer mandate. And I think those are going to go away. Uh, I think it will be uh, much of the goodness of Obamacare that the Republicans have offered many times in the past, uh, insurance portability, uh, the ability of insurance companies to reach across state lines, uh, uh, pre-existing conditions, and so on and so on, many things, uh, will remain in a larger package. But I think the, uh, the mandates will go. And I think that's what it will generally be replaced by. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, Obamacare, as we know it now, the heavy hand of government requiring that you buy insurance and then keep insurance, uh, will remain. And I think, I, think, I think the House is committed to that. I think the Senate is committed to that. And I think that they can move that forward. Can they step over the president to get it done? That remains to be seen. But I think bill after bill after bill is going to come forward to the president, and he'll have to find some way to compromise eventually as they begin to pile on Democrats to help them do this effort in those two chambers. Well, let, let's take more of a look at this with uh, specifically still sticking with Obamacare. Even if the House and the Senate were to vote to repeal it, the president could veto it. But, but you're saying you even see a light for a possible veto override of, uh, that, that would result in the repeal of Obamacare? No, I, 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 don't, I don't think you'll ever get a veto override. And, and if we approach the president as, as Republicans in such a way as you'll do this or we're going to override your veto, we'll never win that argument. We'll never get to the Democrats to join us in getting that done. But Chuck Schumer recently observed, the most bitter partisan of Democrats, that it wasn't the right time to do Obamacare. I think if we, if we just try to replace Obamacare nakedly and walk away, we lose that fight. If we try to replace it, repeal it and replace it with something that's Obamacare light but gets rid of the mandates but puts in a lot of the health care changes that many Democrats would like to see, a bipartisan bill can be generated. And the president, while still not having veto-proof numbers, would have to pay attention to that. And I think they have the ability to get the president to say we can replace it with a better product by Congress. And I think there's a possibility of that happening. About a minute and a half remains in this segment before we get into all the intrigue of uh, House Republican leadership and what may happen in the first vote tomorrow in the House. Let me ask you about another bill that would appear to be low-hanging fruit, Keystone XL Pipeline, because so many unions are in favor of this, the Republicans are in favor of this, we need jobs, we need energy. Uh, can the president be persuaded not to veto the Keystone XL Pipeline? I'm reminded of a vote we took, J.D., um, 20 years ago or 19 years ago, about bankruptcy reform. And the night before, while we were voting, the night before the president vetoed it, um, he had had a big dinner with the trial lawyers you know, where he promised them he'd veto it. Uh, we passed the bill overwhelmingly. It went to the White House. He vetoed it. And then it came right back, and we, we generated uh, veto override numbers very quickly, and we overrode that veto. He knew we'd override it, and he still gave the vote to the trial lawyers to get that done. I think you'll see the same thing with XL. There is veto override numbers. Unlike Obamacare, XL has veto override numbers on it. And the president will veto it, and then we'll override, and it'll become the law of the land. And he'll be able to make the crazy left and his party happy, and we'll be able to do the work of the American people. Oh, so there is uh, the first real piece of good news coming out of the upcoming Congress. Uh, votes there for a veto override of the Keystone XL pipeline. Michael Patrick Flanagan, when we come back, we will talk about the 218 votes required for Speaker and uh, what may be in store for John Boehner. You stay with us here on America's Forum. Let's continue our conversation now with my old congressional colleague, 
former United States Congressman Michael Patrick Flanagan of Illinois, who joins us from Washington, D.C., where he is now the president of Flanagan Consulting. How history might have been different if this man from Illinois were sitting on the other end of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, Mike, 20 years ago, when we were taking the oath of office, there was another member of Congress, a two-termer from Ohio, who was the chairman of the House Republican Conference, took a detour, became chairman of the Education Committee, then came back as Speaker of the House. Will John Boehner see his speakership continue in the vote tomorrow once Congress is convened? I think he will. I think he will, and I think uh, he will get fewer negative votes, fewer votes against him from the conference uh, than he got uh, a term ago. I think John Gizzi observed that earlier today on your program, and I agree with him. I think Boehner is even more solid than, solidly in his numbers than he was before. Well, we hear about these 11th hour challenges and the frustration on the right. Of course, Javier Manharis said a lot of people are happy to, to talk about it behind closed doors. But when push comes to shove and you have to stand up and publicly tell the world uh, whom your choice is for speaker, does that essentially ensure uh, Speaker Boehner's reelection? No, I, 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 think, I, I think that's certainly part of it, when you have to actually stand up there and yell someone else's name. And as you know in that vote, it's not a yes or no vote, it's a name vote. You have to yell a name, and people will yell Boehner or someone else's name, as the case may be. Uh, and I think that what you're going to have is folks who uh, are reminded of the work Boehner did for the conference in this last election. I mean, he raised more money than any speaker in history. He helped build the majority, he helped grow the majority, and a lot of members are there only because Boehner helped them to get there because he is a good, committed Republican, and we can't lose sight of that fact. He, he might be a little soft on immigration, he might be a little soft on the edges on a lot of these things, but he is going to do the will of the conference, and I think the members understand that. And is there irritation over these votes at the end of last year to get them up on and off to accommodate the Senate and, and the President to get it done? Absolutely. Should there be? Absolutely. Uh, and Boehner will, will pay that price in the coming year. But I think holding back uh, Homeland Security and, and ICE that's contained in there and the immigration issues for a short time rather than through the full vote of the year is going to help him. And they're going to generate a bill, and the Republicans will have a great opportunity to come together with John on these issues. And when you say come together with John, uh, the border yeah. bill that you think leadership will draft, will it offer uh, some, quote, guest worker program? In other words, will conservatives see the establishment cave to the amnesty or the, quote, comprehensive uh, reform that so many of the establishment figures in the party want to see? Well, I, I don't call it reform, and I, I know why you called it reform, because that's what the establishment calls it. I don't call it reform. I call it what it is. It is amnesty. And I don't think you're going to see it in the bill. Uh, but I, you're going to have to find some way to attract some Democrats to the bill if you want the president to sign it. If you're going to hold up the entire homeland appropriation based upon this, we could do that. But you're going to eventually close that department, and the media, larger media will call it a government shutdown. You have to find some way to fund homeland through the president to get it done. I'm not sure how you do that without building a bill that comes to some level to which the president is willing to compromise. As I observed earlier on, on your show last week, uh, on the noontime show last week, the president is in no mood to compromise. So you're going to have to build some relationships. You're going to have to find some way to bring him over on this. And the only one who can do that are Democrats. You're going to have to find Democrats in the House and the Senate to find a way through to do this. And, I think and, it can be done, but I think it's going to take longer than a couple of days. Well, Mike, you come from a state where the labor movement is, a, is a, alive and well. Senator Jeff Sessions is suggesting, uh, at least from the vantage point of a, a grassroots Republican guy, that, that we've forgotten about working Americans, that amnesty mm -hmm. just sets up cheap labor. It would seem to me that a lot of those union Democrats, those blue-collar Democrats, would would hear that argument and in turn put pressure on the White House. So might we see some sort of bill that at long last gets tough on illegal immigration? I think we can. I think we really can see a bill, and I, don't, I think this president can help with that. He would never call it that, and he'd never contemplate that it is that, but I think we can. And 
and following sessions, obser observations on this, uh, apart from being real good on the issue, he's also a brilliant legislator, uh, cozying up with big labor to try and help get this done is a terrific idea because you lose then the patina of, you know, crazy people in three-cornered hats wandering around the border. This is a much bigger issue than some Tea Party craziness. This is a, the issue of the future of our nation. And it doesn't, you don't have to be a bitter partisan to agree that we don't want people who've broken our laws to be invited in the country to stay. We have to make some accommodation for people who have been hurt by, the, by the, the actions of their parents and others who have brought them here. That probably has to happen at some point. But it doesn't mean we have to offer them citizenship. And there's a lot of ways to be able to solve this. I think Boehner wants to do that. I think the president wants to do that. But I think the president wants to do more. And that's what he needs to be denied. Well, even though I might resemble that remark about Tea Party craziness, I understand the assessment. Oh, wow. To my good old friend, Michael Patrick Flanagan, sir, we thank you for your time and your comments, and America's Forum will continue.